With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Hey, this is SJ. I'm here with Michael and then the Doctor of Love. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to say that. I did just want to say yeah, that. Yeah, do your Barry White love. So My first, yeah, my last, my you wonder, everything. If this is your first podcast ever with us, <laughs> let me just uh, welcome you to the Exploring More podcast. We're on a podcast series, a journey actually, talking about the masculine journey and the stages of the masculine journey, and how so many of us have had somewhere in our classroom work, high school, college, we had a psychology class. We had developmental psychology. It's a study of human behavior over seasons of time. So in the spiritual realm, we've identified that these stages are true, that in the physical realm, we're observing something that's actually spiritually very, very true, that we're all moving in a direction. And there's forces that are at work for us, and there's forces at work against us. And as kingdom men, we subscribe to this idea that, especially looking back, it's just so much more true looking backward. You don't think about this when you're eight or 18 even, but when you get to these stages, these ages of 30 and 40 and 50, you really do have something to look back on you can take some inventory. You can examine where has my heart been? Who handled it? What was their contribution along the way? And so just as a review, a few weeks ago, we were with Gary Barkalo to talk about the masculine journey overview. We're talking about the stages of masculinity as we've learned them from men like Gordon Dalby and John Eldridge and some of the things they've written and some of the things that then we explored and found them to be very, very helpful, very, very true and very, very important, so that there are these stages in the masculine journey, boyhood, and you could almost put a decade on each of these, at least for a while, that boyhood from one to 10, they overlap, and then the ranger stage is a stage that your meat's not being cut. Yeah, competition comes in. Yeah, there's things that, so Mm -hmm. ranger stage is just a stepping out Mm -hmm. of the living room in the front yard into a larger adventure and how things work. The world is not a safe place. Boyhood, the world should be a really safe place. Your parents are trying to protect you from all kinds of things. But when you start to get mobile with a bike or you start to get mobile with a car, you can find yourself in some pretty dark alleys, risky environments. And so the ranger stage and how things work. And then the ranger stage gives way to a stage we call the warrior stage, where a cause is important to have good leadership, a king, a cause and a king, to have somebody who's investing in you. You start to see the evil in the world and you rise up against it, even the evil in yourself. You start to become aware of a conflict within and you want to do something about it. You want to engage your will for goodness and see these causes of, in our case, Christianity, what's right and good and true, somehow be enforced with your participation. It can be costly. It can be challenging. You don't sit on the sideline, but you're in a very eventful game where good and evil are at work. And as a warrior, you're learning how to participate in that battle, how to fight, how to exercise some of the resources given to you in the kingdom of God. And it can start younger. Sometimes it starts, unfortunately, younger when you have to learn to protect yourself, Mm -hmm. provide for yourself in the warrior stage. And then comes the lover stage, which we're going to talk about After the lover stage, we talked about the king stage last week, and then the week before that, we talked about the sage stage. So those are the stages, and we've tried to give one Exploring More podcast to each stage. And so now we're talking about the lover stage. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, yeah. And so... (laughs) so, Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> if so, you didn't grow up with Barry White, go to uh, yeah. Google no, right don't now. Go, no, don't no, no. Google that. <laughs> okay. Don't Google that. But it sounds a lot like what SJ was imitating. So I think I'd want our listeners to know that in the masculine heart, all these stages are present. 
I can be a boy and in the boyhood stage and I'm presiding over my room or I'm presiding over maybe what I get to wear that day. Yes, I'm under my parents' roof. I don't have full independence, but I remember getting to exercise some rule like a king. Yeah. You got to pick out your own gar animals. Yeah. Did you, yeah. Did, you did you ever rearrange your room? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, move oh, the yeah. bed to the Did other wall. you move wall? the bed to the yeah, other wall? Yeah, Come on, man. That's, that's yeah. king uh-huh. stuff. That's sure. king stuff as a mm-hmm. boy, you know? Yep. Organize your drawers, move some things around. I mean, whatever little Hang bit. Hang a poster on the wall. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not like you have to wait till that stage. It's in you. I mean, have you ever come across a kid, maybe your child, who said something very sagely and wise? Oh, right. Yeah. You know it when they do it. <laughs> they kidding. usually look at you like, what? Why yeah. are you looking at me that way, Dad? <laughs> You know, and so I'm not trying to make this complicated. What I'm saying is that these pieces are in the masculine heart. There's a version of this that's in the feminine heart, and there's a development of these stages. We see this at our weekends, right? When we have, we call it free time. We might as well call it recess. Yeah, no doubt. It looks and We should just start calling it that. Recess. It looks like boys being let out of recess. I remember recess. I remember looking at the clock in whatever class I was in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We had two recesses when I was growing up. Oh man. Two. There was a morning recess and an afternoon, man. Wow. You know, and and, and you hit the playground. And that's what I mean, that these men in their thirties, forties and fifties and older and a little bit younger, we have free time after lunch and there they go, man. They're off to shooting clays or compound bows or fishing some of them for the first time, they're off on hikes. They're throwing the Frisbees. You know, it's a playground. There's a boyish heart mm-hmm. in the heart of every man. Mm-hmm. I still like Disney World. I just do. Mm-hmm. 54. I haven't been in a long time, but I want to go back again. There's a magic there and I can feel very young. I can yeah. feel young at heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. But this stage that we're talking about, I kind of waffle between the king stage and the lover stage. And you were talking about this in the last podcast. They're integrated. They're connected. They evolve to one another. And they're important to see that way. And so the lover stage is something that I think is really important to talk about. But my point is it overlaps other stages. Yeah. Do you think the lover stage overlaps most of or all? Yeah. Yeah. I think when we're really young boys in the boyhood stage, we need to be loved shown how love works and to be safe and to be provided and to be protected. And that's how we're loved. And that models for us what the lover stage looks like. And there's so much more to it than that. But if we are made for love, to be loved and to love others, you know, that's the commandment, love God, love others, then obviously this stage matters a lot, the lover stage. And it's a condition that we have. It's it's something we're equipped for. And it's something that has gone everybody I know, to some degree, has gone wildly wrong. Yeah. So what occurs to me is that the stakes are higher with this stage. There's an opportunity to understand your heart, the heart of God, understand beauty, understand and embrace right. mystery, right? These are lover stage There's an things. opportunity for all those things to be arrested. Yeah. If it overlaps every stage, then that's a huge impact. Yeah. How love works, what love is, why it's important, the wounds and the vows and the agreements that happen seem to have their bearing on this part of our heart significantly, because I think the enemy knows if he can arrest this part of us, it can play out in so many other stages. And it's so important to God, because if it can be healed and redeemed and restored, it plays out in all these other stages. It does. One of the reasons why we tease and also acknowledge Tom as the doctor of love is yeah, because... I think he loves it. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I do. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's because he's taught us so much about this. He's learned, like we all have, learned it the hard way. You know, you learn how not to do it. You know, you look at 1 Corinthians 13, and there's your list. And the greatest of these is love. And how important love is in the scriptures. How significant it is to Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so, to have a lover's heart means that we're not just loving God, but also I think that our receptors are open Mm. to being loved and receiving love. That Mm -hmm. that is, I think when this stage gets awakened, you're actually feeling what you're feeling, seeing it, thinking. You're aware. You're so much more consciously aware of it. You could be experiencing love, but that's kind of maybe just provision and protection. It's a good thing. But when you start to realize how good it is, 
I think you're awakening to the lover stage. Let's just try to describe it some more. How else would you describe this stage that carries through? I would put it this way. We know that young boys, young girls are very open-hearted. They're free. They haven't taken on so much of the world's messaging, and there's a purity and an innocence that we all many times long to live there again, to get back to that, because we get jaded by life. So coming through Cowboy Ranger and the Warrior stage, that is a season quite often of closing of heart for most of us. We internalize, we get very analytical, especially young men. And this stage is when God starts to bring us back to this mm -hmm. place in us that is so crucial. We talk about it. We did podcasts on the getting your heart right back. back. And what is that about? I think this stage is about getting your heart back, about a place in us that God has put there, designed in us, to where we can experience life at a much deeper level, where we start to notice beauty, we start to feel things more. For me, in high school, you know, I was the jock. I was like every other high school guy, pretty much. But I had an English teacher who taught us about poetry and about literature, and one of the things she says, I want you guys to write a paper, you guys and girls. The instructions she gave was, I want you to start to see things differently. I want you to start to look at the world differently, and I want you to notice how you feel, and I want you to start to get in touch with that and write about it. Write a story. Write something describing something you saw and how it made you feel. And that, for some reason, opened up this whole lane for me. You know, she was very encouraging, and she liked what I was writing, and she told me I was a good writer and that I had great sensitivity. You know what that will do oh, for yeah. you especially a teacher I'm gonna that go you around, respect. I'm going to go around yeah. and be more, I'm going to be sensitivity. <laughs> I'm going to be more yeah. sensitive. Yeah. Absolutely. When you're told you're really good at that, you're really sensitive. That's really a permission yeah. to go do and be that. Sure. And what came along with that was compassion. You know, seeing other people, hmm. seeing their pain, seeing that kid in school that nobody likes, you know, that nobody will sit with them for lunch. It makes me want to cry almost right now. Just those kind of things, that starts to awaken in us where it's no longer so much about us and we feel the largeness of life. And then, of course, as that grows and we start to connect with God in that, it just gets richer and richer and more full. But I really believe that this is where life starts to really get interesting for us and some in hard, this stage. And some hard work, some alignment with God to recover it. We were on your back porch a week or so ago and your granddaughter pounding on mm. the window to come out. We had so much rain here the last several weeks, but right, she yeah. wanted out. And, and we both, it's so just, funny, we both stopped talking and just uh, watched her. Just lit us up, yeah. She was doing what you were saying. There was an innocence. The world was kind of where she is, where she was. It was the backyard. It was the grass. It was the puddles. It was the stomping. How old is she? She's two and a half. Yeah. She's adorable. Adorable. <laughs> now, when my daughters were two and a half, I think because I was in a different stage, it was really often about getting them in and out of the car, in sure. and out of the bathtub, in and out of bed, you know. But in the stages that we're in, we could watch that and appreciate that. Do you remember what I told you? What did you tell me? Oh, that reminds me of my girls. Yeah, that's right. It touched a place in me when their hair was like that, when they wore little boots that were a little too big for them, you know, <laughs> and they just clomping around. And it was a sweet moment to yeah. be invited in to see something so beautiful. And I think what you're talking about is the ability to see differently. You mm -hmm. know, things aren't as black and white. There's an aesthetic. Colors increase. You know, you're moving to a wider range and a bigger landscape. The lover does, the lover stage. If you want to know what it looks like or feels like, it is that. It's an expansion mm -hmm. of observation and expansion. You said compassion. Yeah. I think that we would say that's one of the degree programs in the doctor of loveology, you know, is that you've received compassion for hearts around you, whether it's defending them or promoting them, or at least making sure that they don't go unseen because somehow you've either experienced that in a way and you don't want that for somebody. I have experienced that right. and that's exactly right. Right. I can relate. Yeah. I think you said, and I agree, the lover stage is a stage that you're awakened to beauty. I also would say to be awakened to beauty, somehow you have been stopped. You have been slowed down. You don't see that stuff at 80 miles an hour on the interstate. It's true. And I'm talking about figuratively, but I mean, really, beauty is to be drank and enjoyed and seen and observed. And the pace of our lives, the lover stage can really be dormant when 
It's about productivity, accomplishment, getting things done. Nothing wrong with working hard and hard work, but the lover doesn't work hard. Well, what are you working hard for? If yeah. not to be able to enjoy and stop and savor things. I tell this story often, and I wasn't even there. But Tom, a while back, you told me a story about you and some of the other guys years ago went and had slow food or a slow meal. And you just sat. Tell a little bit about that. I mean, because that's a beautiful thing. That's savoring. That's putting your yeah. fork down. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we had this invitation to go out to Colorado to a this lodge ranch kind of environment. Beautiful. It was so beautiful. And we actually took our wives with us. And one of the offerings of that place was these guys loved cooking and they loved modeling and encouraging slow food and all that goes with that at a table together with other people, not rushing. That connotates in my mind just a wonderful evening, you know, and so that's what we would do, all the meals actually, but they encouraged us to do it differently than you normally do. And most people, if you're like me, we just scarf food down and move on, especially during the day. I mean, maybe at night or if you go out to dinner with your wife or friends, we might actually taste the food and slow down chew and it a little bit. <laughs> and that's my point, slowing down, right? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But it, it, that's the point. Go ahead, slow food, slowing down. Go ahead. Yeah, I was Ta just, Taste it, the food. Yeah. And we did all these little fun things. Took a horseback ride out through these mountain trails and just saw things that we didn't see before in our part of the country. So it was delightful. And the whole point of it was intimacy, intimacy with our wives and intimacy with each other as couples and we did some exercises, some exploration of this journey that we're talking yeah, about. We what happened to you in this stage? What was the messaging during the boyhood? What did you take away from that? And so we explored that together. And the fruit of that, I think, has been the depth of friendship that's come out of it for all of us. Yeah, a brotherly love, mm -hmm. uh, intimacy and love within a marriage and yeah. in a redemptive community. Those are good. I want to pull a little bit of the essence, slowing down. Mm-hmm walking rather than running, walking rather than driving. I mean, somewhere along the way, we subscribe to the idea of productivity. And the lover doesn't survive well when in a hurried environment. You talked about meals and slow yeah. food. I think the lover stage recognizes that there is a time for that, for getting some things done. But as you said, can you shut that off and light a candle and serve a table and take some time We've experienced you and all of us cooking, grilling, taking the time, talking around the preparation of a meal. Yeah. You know, having somebody over for dinner for us has become sometimes three and four hours. And I of, think it should be and, that of, long, right? Of conversation. But yeah. there was a time where like, when is this going to end? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's like- One hour hey, and 15 now, minutes. Yeah, so let's Tom go. or you're like, hey, can you guys go home? You know, yes. It's, it's, it's getting late. <laughs> let's keep trying to describe this idea. Walking, you said beauty. I want to capitalize on that. I think that the lover stage is one who can operate in beauty. I'm not sure about this. I'm going to propose it. I think people are one of two creatures when it comes to beauty. You either like the mountains or you like the ocean. You're either a beach guy <laughs> or a mountain guy. You know, well, what, are you, what are you? If I'm forced to choose, I'm going to choose the beach, but I do love oh, them both. Oh, you're disappointed. Yeah. Me. You know why? Because my wife loves the yeah, beach. Yeah, I want to sell yeah. out. <laughs> Romantic. That's just, and it's usually, and I, it's usually did, warmer. It is yeah. usually warmer. But I did. I grew up on the water. I grew up on Cape, Cape Cod, Cod and Massachusetts. Yep. And when I go to the water, I get energy from it. It's like going back. You to may me. be on something on the grew up on. So when I was in boyhood, we lived in the Pacific Northwest. Oh yeah, and even the beaches were cold. Right and rocky you know, and rocky yeah. and climbing trees and climbing rocks and mountains. And as a boy, could maybe that's part of why I like the mountains. I don't not like the beach, but if I had my preference, I love walking in the woods. I love walking with God in the woods, mm -hmm. walking with my dogs in the woods, watching them do their thing, what they're made for, encountering nature mm -hmm. in either one of those environments. You know, when we've been at the beach together and, and there's dolphins, you know, we all just stop yeah. mm -hmm. and are stunned. Beautiful right. sunrise. Sunrises mm -hmm. and sunsets birds. on the clouds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, birds and... Yeah. Osprey and yeah. pelicans and... So those are lover traits. Those are things that your lover's heart is turned on when you can observe those things. I think for me, one of the big transitions was kind of moving from a consumer to a provider. I think there is an awakening 
especially for men on the masculine journey, when we are awakened to the beauty of a girl. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, there's a reason why this stage is where we have it. It's after the warrior stage. But so many of us went from boyhood to lover. But the real place that this stage fits in the linear would be boyhood, ranger, warrior, lover, king. And I think it's there for a good reason. When the lover stage comes in and, and you want to enjoy something or you want to enjoy her or you want to experience her, and somehow, some way that stays in a, for me, I want to enjoy her, that lover gets arrested by the consumer. And it kind of blows the circuits of a boy. Pornography's oh, definitely. a storyline that's come into most boys' mm-hmm. lives at such an early stage, and it blows the circuits. Twists it, twists it all up. I mean, it becomes and they become majorly ob- derailed. And they become objects, mm-hmm. and they become somewhat- For use. For use. Rather and than consum- pursuit. And consumption. Rather than offering your strength to her, mm-hmm. you try to get it from her. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And I think that is just, in our stories, we see that in men's stories all over. I'll say it again, where you try to get your strength from her rather than offering your strength to her. If yeah. your lover is arrested in that space, we got to yeah. go get it. You know, we need to rescue your lover heart. And we'll talk some more about that right after this break. Marriage may be the most sacred of all human relationships. Two people coming together as one. There may not be anything more powerful than two people walking with God together. It's kind of mind boggling, actually. And because of the power and weight of marriage in the kingdom, it should not come as any surprise that marriage is violently opposed. It's a favorite target of the enemy. We believe this is why you don't have to look very far to find a marriage that is in trouble. Assaults on marriage and challenges to marriage are everywhere. But we at Zoe know there is a way for couples to make a comeback. Learn how to fight back enjoy being restored, and actually thrive in the midst of day-to-day battles of life. Marriage is worth fighting for, and having the right weapons and tools, training and orientation is crucial. That's why we created The Rendezvous Project, a 12-session video series recorded live during one of our recent Rendezvous Weekend Marriage Conferences. Through The Rendezvous Project, We hope to empower marriages to either take a weekend away together and host your own marriage retreat, or journey together in a weekly small group, discovering your true heart, the deep and beautiful heart of your marriage, the context of the larger story your marriage is in, and how to walk intimately with God together. For more information about The Rendezvous Project, and to stay up to date with the latest news leading up to its release, Visit therendezvousproject.com. Welcome back. This is SJ. I'm here with Michael and Tom, and we're talking about the lover stage of masculinity. And we just started kind of wading into how a man's heart can be arrested, circuits can be blown when the enemy might bring pornography across his path. I think a lot of us, Michael, you and I, I think have similar stories, you know, about 12 years old and... Jimmy, the neighbor kid down the street, said, look what I got out of my dad's closet out in the woods somewhere or up in the treehouse. And that was the first introduction. And my circuits got blown for sure. It arrested me and arrested my little heart. I didn't even really know what I was looking at. It was overwhelming. So it can carry with you throughout your whole life and really impact you in this way of subterfuge the enemy Mm -hmm. uses. And you don't even know it's affecting you or your relationship with your wife or other women in your life. You may not even be aware of what's going on at all. And we talked about how these things trickle on into the next phase. So in the ranger stage, if it's arrested so early, the woman, the girl becomes the adventure. And, Rather than and, inviting and, and, her on and the And in how things work, you're trying to work that. That, that becomes angle. such a yep. priority. How can I arrange for one of those to like me or be alone with me or let me have mm-hmm. or let me do? And then you step into the warrior stage. It can be an awful fighting for a possession. Again, right. trying to get my strength from her rather than offering my strength to her. Share the story. You've shared it before. I don't know that you've shared it on the podcast. You've fought this battle and you've fought it well. I remember you sharing a story about getting Robin flowers. 
Yeah, yeah. And yeah. how the enemy assaulted you in that. Yeah, I was in my late 30s. On well the, into the warrior yeah, stage. Yeah, well into the yeah. warrior stage. Not yet a king, but I had three girls and was learning a lot about this message and how to walk in it. Was becoming more and more aware of my thoughts, what I think, and sometimes what I'm not even in control of thinking. It's just kind of the programming of thoughts. And so becoming more aware of that. So all that's kind of accumulating in this day that I'm at a Kroger or a Target, a grocery, you know, when they have those end caps of flowers, you know, oh, just yeah. sticking They're out there. strategic. Yeah, yeah, right there on the way in, you <laughs> yeah. know, and, but there were some roses there and they were beautiful. They looked like they were going to be beautiful and they weren't that expensive. So I just grabbed a dozen roses and just because Robin loves them, you know, and it wasn't a birthday. It wasn't an anniversary. There was really not a big occasion. It was just a, I know she loves them. I'm going to get her these. I need to let her know that she's doing a great job with our girls, young mom, young family. So so that's the lover's heart. That's the lover's right heart. There. By yeah. the time I am getting to the checkout stand, I am being accused of things. You know why you're getting those. And if I could show our listeners, it would be this voice comes in, you know why you're getting those. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, the sunken, you're, you're right. the, the sunken feeling. <laughs> thanks, yeah, I'm, thanks for that. I'm having this yeah. yeah. So here comes the gavel, right? Here comes the verdict that you're getting these to improve your chances. That's what was implied. You're getting these to show off. You're get, I mean, there was just accusation around. So by the time I check out, I didn't put them back. By the time I get them home to her, it's kind of like here. <laughs> here. You got Versus, some flowers. Yeah. And I felt like I wanted to explain. And it's not because I want anything or it's not, but the enemy had enough truth in that because there was a stage that I would do things like that mm -hmm. with the motive of getting something in return. Right. And it could be emptying the dishes, <laughs> the dishwasher. It could be folding laundry. It could be tucking the girls in. God began to untangle me from such a mess of something I subscribed to probably in junior high, like most of us did as boys. If I do this and this, then they might do this and this. Yeah, I think Dates, that's it. Man. Dinner, yep. movies. If you pay for those things, maybe they'll pay you back. And that's the perversion of the lover's heart. Right. It really is. Yeah. And yeah. so where does that go? Now, I'm not 16. I'm 38, 39, 40, <laughs> to, to our there. points in other moments of this podcast, it's in there. And the enemy's using it to indict me. It's an indictment on my heart, my character, and my love for my wife. And it was just that easy. All they had to do was whisper, you know why you're doing that. And it wasn't true. But if I believe it, what is it? Might as well be. Might yeah. as well be true. I think that's a great, goofy not fun example of how this thing can get tangled up <laughs> sure, and where that consumer that men can become or are invited to become from the enemy. And we don't really even know what it's going on. I mean, the whole pornography idea is such an arresting of this stage and all of us have encountered it to varying degrees. And that's why the warrior is really important is to rise up, to walk with God and to even unpack where's that coming from? Yes, there's a physiological part of this where you're mm -hmm. training your body, like Pavlov's dog, you're training your body to do this and want this. How do you get out of those patterns? How do you break habits of addiction? How do you step away from that? And you will have to fight. Your will will have to engage. The warrior will have to be summoned and partner with God for a deliverance that you and he can do. It sounded like a movie trailer you just did. Yeah. Their warrior will be summoned. summoned. Yeah. No, it's so good though. Yeah. It's so and it's, true. it's difficult to overcome that patterning in our brains, in our lives. Yeah. Because for most of us that got involved in pornography, it usually goes over a fairly long span of time, if, especially if it starts in your youth, Isn't that like when you're 12. Yeah. You may be 35 or you may be just getting married and thinking, okay. This is no good anymore. But even then, you've got a lot of years of programming. And that's why sexual intimacy among a husband and a wife is designed to be the most wonderful, beautiful, nurturing, intimate, connecting thing possible. And because it's been twisted on the front end of most people's lives, there is a lot of work to be done. I know in my marriage, we had a season of time where we were just working through all of our stuff in that area. And... 
one of the things Pat will say is that I was very persistent <laughs> in trying to work through it because I didn't want to live that, that way, way anymore. Right. I didn't. I didn't want to be having fantasies in my head while we're trying to be connected yeah, intimately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet that's kind of the place that many men find themselves in. So the hope of healing of that is that as we do enter into the lover stage on the level of the heart and especially connecting with God, some of the draw of that can be so diminished because what we're really reaching for isn't that image anyway or that perfection or that physicality. It's so much more about intimacy and validation even, you know. And so when God starts to provide that for us or we go to Him for that, And I went through a long season of that that was so helpful. But God will give deliverance too, prayer. I mean, there are so many approaches to this, but finding a better substitute is always going to work a lot better than just sheer will. Will. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's like your fingers in the dam. You can't keep them all plugged up. It's going to come out somewhere. I got 50 things to say. (laughs) (laughs) And you got 51. Yeah, yeah. So what keeps a man from coming to God with yes, yes, is, yes, is shame. It is mm-hmm. so, particularly over so, this one so the issue. Enemy, mm-hmm. enemy will invite you to do this. Shame could be coming from his wife. That's right, or from God. I mean, that's what yeah. the enemy's going to put. Yeah, God it on. won't listen to me. Won't talk that, to me. That, that, right, that, right. Until I that fix shame, this. Yeah, I'm clean. And so I think about this with my own kids when they've made mistakes in any way, shape, or form, especially some of these things that are hard in the stages of masculine or feminine heart. So. I don't want them to believe that I'm mad at them as much as I'm mad at it. I want them to come to me. I want to help them. Now, some fathers aren't in that space yet, and I wasn't always in that space. There was a time when I think I actually reinforced the very thing the enemy was trying to tell them, you cannot tell your dad. He'll be so mad. And I would back that whole proposition up. By being so mad. By being so mad when they're little. So, you know, it's not like I didn't contribute to even the enemy. I gave the enemy the ammo to shoot them with in other situations so that when something harder went down, they would hide or not come forth. So you talked about the courage to come to God. And I think about when my kids get hurt, I'm upset that they're hurt, but I'm not upset at them. And yet their little hearts can't distinguish that. But to your point, even as men become older, boys become men, they can carry that attitude with them well into their adulthood, well into their fatherhood, and well into their being husbands that shame has the upper hand on this. And their their view of God is in the way of the deliverance that is available. I'm not saying it's not 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 hard fought. I'm not saying it's not going to take some time and struggle to walk with God in a way that would reprogram this beautiful system that's been arrested and compromised by an enemy. But I so appreciate what you said. And I know that there's victory in this area Mm-hmm. And sometimes instead of two steps forward, three steps back, you can graduate to two steps forward, one step back. And then it's several steps forward in these moments of compromise and learning how to fight. You are captive to this thing. And I love the idea that God loves me so fiercely that he will come after this mm-hmm. for me. You know, there's something that just popped in my thoughts is this idea that what we're reaching for, what is it that we're reaching for in the feminine, in the feminine beauty, in that whole genre? It's an essence that God created. In other words, God has that, the profile of God is also the feminine, nurturing lover heart. The reason I brought this up is that many of our friends listening may not have had a good experience with their mom, with a mother. They weren't mothered well for many, many reasons. And that's not an indictment on anyone. It's just life, too many kids or an illness or struggles or dad's gone. And this was part of my story. When that's not fulfilled, we will reach for it somewhere. And what I'm the encouragement that I'm saying is God can provide that too. Jesus gave us the image of God as a father, but God is also a mother. Women are just as much image bearers of God as we are. So if that's part of your story, or if somehow there was some kind of a sexual encounter that was too young where you were violated and somehow your innocence was stolen, those are things that on a spirit level can set in place something in us that needs to be addressed either through counseling or friendship or walking with God, but taking these things on directly and pursuing healing in those areas, other stuff can just fall off, fall yeah. away. It just doesn't yeah. have the power anymore. Yeah, yeah it it's is. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. To see the lover restored, 
Mm -hmm. You're proposing that you may not have to meet this trial or addiction head on. You may need to veer right over here towards God's love. That's what I'm saying. It's not a matter of stop doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing your proposition that it could be more about receiving something that you missed. That's the lie that's been so effectively spread, I think, by the enemy, that we have to do more, sin less, be better, buck up, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and just not sin anymore. And that's not helpful. Yeah. And it's not sustainable. Pursuing the heart of God, pursuing the love of God for that healing, for that understanding that you are beloved, and he has nothing but love for you. So there's a better... Starting with that, there's a better, right? There's a better counter to this idea that you're proposing of not sinning less, but being loved by God more. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Which That's results exactly in right. you sinning less. Yes, that, you know, you yeah. said, you said and it's it not one your sentence. power, it's, it's so his. True. Yeah, write it's that so down. True. I hate when I do that. It's <laughs> one, but it's, but it's, I think we're really, really wanting to offer some hope. This stage exactly. gets arrested because this stage is so important. And, Truly. And for me, there was a learning in my 30s of God as lover. I mean, speaking directly to what you're saying, as a Mm -hmm. part of my redemption and restoration journey in my 30s, I was proposed the idea that God as lover. And Robin said this in the podcast with the girls. The Kingdom uh, Romance. Kingdom Romance. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. We do these podcasts and I'm here and I'm a part of this, but when I really enjoy them is when I get to listen to them and I hear some of the things that you guys say. And yeah, yeah. And so one of the things Robin said about just the lover and how, oh, what was it now? I just forgot it again. Do you remember? You don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we recorded yeah. three yeah. hour long podcasts. Yeah, yeah, so. Which one was yeah, it? Yeah, was Which... it the one about the feminine heart? The masculine yeah. heart? Yeah. Kingdom romance. It was God is lover. Oh, and, okay. And romancing. Romancing And, and, and romancing yeah. me. And, and the idea that seeing him like that, it was a category unavailable to me in the yeah, academic, you've been talking about that. In the academic and in the theological yeah, I remember what you're of talking God. About. And so, I mean, Sacred Romance was a big part of that. We've talked sure. a lot about that book on the podcast mm-hmm. and how important that was. It just had categories that I did not know and did not know how and was unaware that it was available to me. So having an academic understanding of God is different than having an experiential being loved by God. I know what it was. I remember right now. It was when Robin said, it's not just that God loves me. She said, he's "He's in in love love with with me. me. And I remember when we first discovered Mm -hmm. that proposition and then we tested it. Right. And then we tasted it Mm -hmm. and saw that God was good. We felt that. And I've said this before. I really believe that as lovers created to love and be loved, we were created to be lovers, to be in love with God and let him love us. And so I really believe that we're missing something when we throw out the idea that you can feel this, you can experience this, you can enjoy this, that God as being in love with you and the many, many ways he wants to show you how true it is. Yeah. So Michael, the thing that's coming to my head as you're describing that is regardless of kind of what side of the fence you land on in regards to the controversy surrounding the book and movie, The Shack. Mac goes through this traumatic thing with his daughter. Right. And then God comes into his life. God appears to him, right? And (laughs) appears to him in a way that he needs God to appear to him. Do you remember? God appears to him as this mom figure, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and just loves him that way because that's the way that he could receive. African-American woman. Right. right? Because he had this picture. And she even says to him at some point, I appear to you this way because if I appeared to you as the grisly old gray hair Mm -hmm. man, you wouldn't have talked to me. You would have rejected me immediately. So he goes through this process of a softening of his heart so that then the loving God who's in love with him, yeah. can take Especially, him back. Particularly fond of particularly him. Particularly fond of him, can take him back where he needs to go for healing. Yeah, that's a beautiful idea, a beautiful scene, a beautiful reality. The other one that came to my mind, I wrote something down, was Mr. Holland's opus. Yeah. How many times have we seen Play the Sunset? Mm-hmm. And there's something Close about- your eyes. There's something <laughs> about the lover in us that is summoned in that. Mm. And the same thing with Mr. Holland. I can teach you notes on a page. Mm -hmm. Music is supposed to be fun. Play the sunset. 
And <laughs> here's 400 men going, just, <laughs> yeah. just absolutely yeah. unraveled yeah. by that scene because it's beauty, it's rescue. Our hearts recognize that in story. Our hearts are moved by that in good story. Mm-hmm. And you are a good story. We just don't recognize it enough in ours, right. in our own. And that's the proposition, is to move from the academic and the aesthetic and the theological, which aren't bad, but to the experiential. I was just talking with a guy today about coffee. He was asking a little bit more about what we do. And I said, you know, there's a lot of engineers in the kingdom, but there's not enough pilots. And I went on to explain to him what I meant by that. Really, the greatest pilots are the engineers who've learned how to fly. They know how this works. Yeah. They know the physics of it. They understand that. But they also know the joy of a view that only a pilot can have of a sunset or a thunderstorm off in the distance or a lighted city Mm -hmm. that they're flying by. peninsula in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the lover stage. And I think it's important to reemphasize where we started out earlier with the idea of slowing down, slow food. Mm. Slow your life down, at least for some of it. Friends, there's so much going on that's a distraction from everything we just talked about. Being able to experience God that way, to be able to offer love, to be able to offer compassion, to be able to be in the moment and have an effect in real time versus being lost and caught up in the next thing you're going to do or where you're rushing and hurrying to, because I fall into that quite a bit. But to pursue this awakening of the lover in us needs some quiet, needs some slow, needs a lifestyle change quite yeah. often, to be honest. You it know, does. If we keep doing the things we've We're, been doing, doing the way and, we've been doing Expecting it, different results, <laughs> that's insanity. Yeah. My encouragement yeah. would be find some time for you and God, just the two just together. And you know how it is. God's effect is pretty powerful. And just being with him in a completely attentive way is transforming and it's healing, I believe is absolutely essential if we want to get our arms around this idea of becoming a lover and loving well and experiencing our belovedness. Enjoying that, enjoying life in that context is so different than the way we used to live. All of us, we could say, the three of us sitting right here, we used to live very differently. Unfortunately, (laughs) yes. And fortunately, I think about how much productivity I even brought into my time with God. There was Mm -hmm. things to accomplish. (laughs) Well, it was like Jim was saying yesterday we were meeting, you know, there's a difference between, you know, doing the devote. I mean, you can shift maybe some of your time of reading scripture or devotionals or learning intellectual information, interesting things about the Bible, interesting things about our faith. But if we don't have this other component, it's like eating cardboard. It's not tasty. It's not wonderful. It's not the same. So that's part of the culture that we've bought into and here. Adv- and advocate, you know. Well, yeah. what our culture has cast aside, has eschewed, is the time to ruminate. Mm-hmm. The time to reflect, lay down, and, you know, chew on something for a while. Well, most of we're, us, when we lay so, down, we'll fall asleep. We'll fall asleep <laughs> like, from exhaustion. Like, like the disciples did in the yeah. garden, you know, we just, yeah. because oh, we're, man, we're just... need a break. <laughs> we just do. We <laughs> yeah. just need rest. Yeah. We, yeah. That's the point, to Re- rest yeah. and rest with him and in him and to care for this. A journal and a pen might be a good occasion from time to time, a good alternative to your Bible and a highlighter. Yeah, I would say the vast majority of us to that point, we don't need any more information. Information. Mm -hmm. We need time to process and journal and and pray and and listen listen about the information that's been given. And listen to God, yeah, Yeah. and hear his voice and put down the props Yeah, and just take him up on this offer. Come to me and I'll give you rest. I would say... Don't come to me and bring your Bible and highlighter. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, come to me, come be with me, rest with me. Lay lay beside still waters with me. Yeah. 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 I would say to Michael, the thing that as we land this plane, as you referred to pilots, probably the keystone for the Heart of a Warrior Encounter weekend, one of the things that I so appreciated and had never experienced before when I went was the time alone with God. The teaching is insanely good. So great. And I'm not just saying that because two of my friends who teach at the weekend are sitting here at the table with me. It is great teaching. We can get so much great teaching, though, in other places. What we don't get is what we just described, that intentional time. The guys at the weekend, there's 400 guys there, they actually make an agreement, okay, we're going to be silent so that we can go out 
and find a rock by a stream or spot under a tree and just spend this intentional quiet time with God. It's rare. Yeah. It's rare. And the lover's heart for it to grow, for it to blossom, for it to experience what it was made for, you have to engage in putting it in those environments, in those places, and see what God does. Yeah. Requires intentionality and an investment of time. The lover really does. Well, thank you listeners for spending this time with us. If you've got questions or comments that you want to throw into this conversation, email us exploringmore at zoe.org. Thanks again for joining us in this conversation. Tom, Michael, it's always good to be with you. you too, good to be with you too. You guys are awesome. See you next week. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on Uversion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more. Thank you.